Yip Bang at the North Burma front. Chinese casualties of the Burma fighting at the battlefront at Yip Bang in the Hukuang Valley, Burma. Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell watches as they are taken to the rear for treatment. This is Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Seagraves, head of the medical staff of the only hospital in these jungles, an American unit operating seven miles behind the front lines. Operating tables are set up in the open, protected only by canvas roofing. Since the hospital is so close to the front lines, electricity has not yet been installed, and after dark, treatment and operations are performed by the light of lanterns and flashlights. Because of the constant presence of snipers, most of the wounded are brought to the hospital during the night. They make the seven-mile trip over jungle trails and crude, man-carried litters. The staff of the hospital is composed of American Army personnel and Burmese nurses. Many of these nurses had been trained by Seagraves in Burma before the Japanese occupation. They learn quickly and well, and have often performed delicate operations in the field. Some of them accompanied Stilwell on his retreat from Burma in 1942. A nursing school has been established in India to train more of these Burmese girls. The casualties receive expert medical attention and are made as comfortable as possible in preparation for the long trip to Xinbuyang. At the time these pictures were taken, all casualties were carried on litters for 14 miles back to Xinbuyang, where a landing strip had been constructed for the use of L-4s and L-5s. Here, the wounded are carefully transferred to special stretchers and made ready for the flight to Lido, where there is a well-equipped general hospital. It takes 15 days to make the trip to Lido by foot, but these small planes make it in an hour. This is a plane of the 71st Liaison Squadron, which is based at Lido. The 71st operates 13 L-4s and 4 L-5s in this area. Three of the planes have been stripped of all but the most essential equipment, so that stretches could be carried in the small fuselage. Three other L-4s ferry out casualties that can sit in the regular seat behind the pilot. In addition to this ambulance service, the 71st Liaison Squadron also performs courier duty to advanced outposts and delivers vital supplies and personnel. This is the Lido landing strip, built alongside the Lido Road about seven miles outside of town. The strip, 2,000 feet long, was cut out of the jungle by American engineers. Ambulances drive out on the strip to meet the planes, and the patients are transferred again.
This is the last stage of their journey from the front. The ambulances take them to the general hospital at Lido. As soon as possible after the delivery of a patient, the L4s, loaded with return cargo, take off again for Shinbuyang. Wantian, China. In order to examine and photograph a Jap Zero that had been reported shot down near Wantian, China, men from the 14th Air Force, including a member of the 16th Combat Camera Unit, proceeded by Jeep westward on the Burma Road and southward on auxiliary Chinese trails to Yeo Kwan. Yeo Kwan is on a mountain, and the path to it is a block stone trail whose steps vary in height from 4 inches to a maximum of 17 inches. Approaching Yeo Kwan, the group was subjected to hostile gunfire, but the enemy was driven off. This was the first jeep to enter the city, and the crowd of curious natives made progress difficult. Even in this remote Chinese settlement, American personnel has already made its influence felt on the local tradespeople. From Yeo Kwan, the party proceeded by pack train over a mountain range to the valley town of Wantian. Here they located the stripped remains of an Oscar Mark II, but were unable to locate the Zero originally reported to be in the vicinity. During the early part of the return trip to Yeo Kwan, ponies were used. But later on, the journey proved too difficult for them, so the last 10 miles was made on foot. Mounted once again on the more familiar jeep, the men started on the long trip back to their base. Flyers down in St. George's Channel, separating New Britain and New Ireland. These twin-engine consolidated Catalinas, affectionately nicknamed Dumbo, are operated by the Joint Allied Command in the South Pacific to rescue flyers who have been downed at sea. This particular Dumbo has just been notified that a plane is down in the waters of St. George's Channel, a body of water 22 miles wide between New Britain and New Ireland. Dumbo, manned by New Zealanders, takes off to rescue the crew. Eight Corsairs furnish fighter protection on this mission, since the pickup must be made within sight of the Japanese on New Britain and New Ireland. Sea marker die and smoke signals are used to help guide the rescue plane to the flyers, who are now aboard a rubber raft. The BBY comes in for a landing while the Corsairs continue to circle overhead. These men are the crew of a Grumman Avenger, which was damaged during an attack against shipping in Rabaul Harbor. Before being forced to ditch, the radio operator had been able to send the distress signal that brought the PBY. During the flight back to base, the rescued aviators are made as comfortable as possible with hot drinks and cigarettes. Dumbo returns to the South Pacific Harbor where its mothership, the USS Coos Bay, is anchored. The USS Coos Bay has a completely equipped hospital that treats not only battle casualties, but also all the personnel in the area. The flyers are taken ashore in a launch to be returned to their own unit, while the Catalina rides at its mooring on the alert for another call. On the following day, Dumbo, with fighter cover, makes another rescue within sight of Jap positions. This Marine captain, flying an SBD, was forced to make a water landing after his engine was hit while strafing an ACAC position on Cape St. George, New Ireland. Before ditching, he sent a distress signal with position. He enjoys warm food and a chance to relax during the flight back.
The mother ship may be seen in the harbor below as Dumbo prepares to land. Target, Palusak Island in the Caroline Group. Bad weather and navigational difficulties forced 22 B-24s of the 307th Group, 13th Air Force, en route to attack Eaton Island in the troop group to switch to the secondary target, Palusak Island, about 180 miles west-southwest of troop. This mission, flown on March 26, without fighter escort, was the first attack made in this vicinity by the 307th group. Palusuk was hit heavily. There was neither fighter interception nor ACAC. On December 3rd, B-24s were slated for a mission to bonus. Bad weather forced them to proceed to the secondary target at Kieta on the eastern coast of Bougainville Island. Medium ACAC was encountered. Bombs rained all over the installations at Kieta. Kahili and Kara, other Japanese bases on Bougainville, and Bailali had been inactive for several days. Apparently, the Japanese had decided that to repair these airdromes was a waste of time. On December 4th, the supply depot was bombed to the south of Buka Passage. Hits were scored. There was very little ACAC and no interception. One B-24 was lost, reason unknown. The Junkers 88 is currently Germany's most versatile airplane. This particular model is an earlier one, a JU-88A5. It's a straight medium bomber used for either dive bombing or medium altitude horizontal attack. This plane has a wingspan of 65 feet 9 inches, is 47 feet long, and 16 feet 7 inches high. It's powered by two Jumo 211J engines, which develop 1,260 horsepower each at 12,500 feet. The armament consists of one 20 millimeter cannon in the nose and seven or eight 7.9 machine guns. It carries a crew of four. The JU-88A5 has a maximum speed of 291 miles per hour at 14,000 feet. Its service sailing is 32,500 feet, and it can climb to 16,500 feet in 21.4 minutes. The latest versions of the JU-88 are noted for their speed, maneuverability, and general performance. They are used not only as a medium and dive bomber, but also for reconnaissance and mine laying. One of the newer major air bases of the Chinese-American wing is located at Guilin, about 450 miles southeast of Chongqing. For maximum protection, installations are keyed back among the limestone buttes, 
making taxiways and hangars hard to strop. The personnel consists of Chinese flyers who receive their advanced training, as you can see by their occupation, in the United States. These men have already seen service against the Japs. They are supplemented by seasoned American pilots selected from the 14th Air Force. The ground crews are also a mixture of Chinese and American mechanics. The cooperation between the Chinese and American Air Forces has surmounted even the difficulty of languages. These men work side by side and fly wing to wing against the Japs in occupied China. Chinese American wing is under the command of Major General Chenault and is a striking force consisting of B-25s and P-40s. It was activated in July 1942 and for over a year trained intensively in India under the China-India Burma Air Force Training Command. This B-24 does not belong to the Chinese-American wing. Nor does this Liberator, which crashed before it left the ground. The left tire blew, causing the smash-up. One man was killed. This is the crew of a B-24 of the 308th Bomb Group, which started on a mission to Kowloon. Serious engine trouble developed, and seven men were ordered to bail out. With the load thus lightened, the pilot, engineer, and radio operator were able to bring the bomber in. Twelve days later, five of the crew returned to the base. Two men are still missing. When uh, the alarm bell first rang, I bailed out. The bomber didn't follow me. Apparently, I was the second man out. The was the third. And the three of us landed in the river. I swam on one side, and the other two men swam on the other side, and that's the last I saw of them for a while. Uh, what happened to you, uh, what happened to your parachute when you landed in the river? How did you get away from it? Well, it, 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 at first I had quite a job, and I'd forgotten I had my life belt on. So I finally remembered that and inflated it, and that kept me above water until I could get out of my parachute. How'd the equipment work? The equipment couldn't have worked better. So thankful it did too, because a person's life depending on one piece of silk, you don't want it to hold together. Feeling out at night, though, what does that feel like? Well, not much feeling to it. You sort of think about the last time you went to church, and, and when the parachute opens, why, well, there's not much else to think about. How long did it take you to get in? Twelve days. Twelve days. Who helped you to get in? Well, the Chinese uh, the government, the Chinese soldiers, the guerrillas, and also the uh, missionaries, both American and Chinese. And, and we discovered that the people over here are really the wonderful people, and receptions and dinners that were granted us and bestowed upon us at every place we stopped was really magnificent. I said, hand it to the Chinese, we just wouldn't have made it. Chinese and missionaries. And missionaries. Right. He looked like you gained weight on the trip back. I wouldn't doubt it a trip. All that food that we ate was right. compulsory to go someplace. People really treated you die yesterday. This person couldn't have been better. <laughs>